Okay, so today we're going to talk about special relativity, and uh, you know, I suppose in the in the course of education of any student, at least in physics, there comes a day when you know you first start getting into Einstein, and uh, it is true, you know, in the sense that he is this revered character for a good reason. I mean, he his theories of uh, space and time, which we're going to touch on today, did fundamentally alter both how we view the universe, what we're able to do. And you know the very conceptions of time and space themselves. Now, uh, even before again, before I write anything, I mentioned this earlier in the term about what is intuition, and this is maybe the most uh, salient place where your intuition is not going to agree with the things that we talk about. And I want to remind you what intuition is, at least in part. It's experience, right? It's if if you lived on a planet, we we have gravity here, for instance, right? And so you understand how to throw a ball and basically what it's going to do. Like You don't have to run a calculation to do that. And that's because you have such a huge level of experience with uh, size scales, length scales, uh, time scale speeds, etc. that are relatively low, uh, the speed scale at least, that um, you know, you have, you've built up some notion of how the world works uh, in a physics perspective, you know, like how things move, for instance, and how time passes by for that matter as well. And of course, what it means to be a physically consistent theory, and by to be really clear here, when I say the word theory, I actually mean uh, a body of knowledge that is very well supported, that has a theoretical underpinning, and is very well supported by experiments. So it's not just it's not Einstein's theory of special relativity. It's not like his whimsical idea of special relativity. It's it's a body of work that is extraordinarily well supported. I mean, basically, there's nothing that disagrees with it thus far, uh, and there are still ongoing experiments. So. <clears throat> point being is, yeah, you're, we're going to reach points today where you're like, what? Uh, but everything we have measured when we get to the right scales uh, confirms this. So without, uh, oh, and one last thing, sorry, I forgot, which is none of this material for special relativity, there's going to be no tutorial on it and no homework, and it's not going to be on the final. So you might say, why am I listening to this then? Well, if you ask that question, then go ahead and go now. Uh, if, however, you just want to, you know, watch a fun video about special relativity related to content from the class, adding to it in some sense, uh, then please stick around. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with uh, a few definitions and things. And let's start by defining uh, what is a frame of reference. So frame of reference, which I will sometimes abbreviate as reference frame, RF. <clears throat> And so here's where we're going to imagine that, you know, you're standing here, here you are, and basically your head is, you know, your point of observation. So we're going to, we're going to put an origin of coordinate system on your head. Maybe we'll call this Y, maybe we'll call this X, maybe we'll call that Z. So in your frame, no matter how, how you're moving, that coordinate system will always be attached to you, right? So, and of course, it doesn't have to be on your head. Maybe it's in your hand. Maybe it's on a desk next to you. But as long as you're stationary with respect to the origin of that coordinate system, that is going to be your, that, that is a suitable frame of reference for you. And of course, there could be somebody else who's maybe, just for sake of argument, you know, let's see how well I can draw a bike on the fly here. I don't think go down like that, right? And then they have some bars and things. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so you got somebody on a bike and you know they're moving at some speed v, let's say, and they of course are carrying with them their own coordinate system, right? So uh, of course I put the arrow. Hold on, move that down there. Bike is going this way. Okay, and they have their own coordinate system, which I'll call prime. So y prime, x prime, and z prime, right? Each of these is a unique coordinate system that, for instance, you could have an object in space. Maybe it's a little bird, right? That's my uh, my seagull or whatever, and this has some coordinate. Uh, vector that specifies where that bird is, oh, bird, and so does this one, right? And of course, we're going to be talking about relative motion. That's where the notion of relativity comes in. Uh, but for the moment, imagine that the bird is stationary and still able to fly. I guess uh, hummingbirds can do that. So it's a hummingbird, uh, and the vector that specifies from. And let's give these characters uh, names. We're always going to leave Anna on the ground, and we'll make Carlos always the moving one. 
hopefully I'll be consistent. So Anna and Carlos, in both of their coordinate systems, have the ability to specify the position of anything in their surroundings. Of course, exactly what the numbers x, y, and z, or x prime, y prime, and z prime are equal to depends on you know where the origin of their coordinate system is. But let's just imagine that they each have one, one such coordinate system. So each of these things, uh, I'll even use a different color here. Each of these things, this is a frame of reference. So RF, reference frame. And of course, this is a frame of reference as well. Right? These are different reference frames. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to call any, any reference frame in which we, the observer that we're talking about, or whoever we're talking about, is stationary. We're going to call that S. And we're going to call this one that moves with a velocity V. We're going to call this one S prime. Okay? So the prime is the difference between Anna, who is stationary, and Carlos, who is moving at some velocity v. And we'll, we'll you know, dig in there in a moment. Now, there's some interesting things that uh, happen. So first off, if I have, let me actually just copy this picture. So I will see what I can do here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Get rid of some superfluous stuff. Don't need that. Don't need that. Okay, so let's okay, so let's look at these two coordinate systems. Now, they're moving with some velocity, this guy right here, with respect to each other, and both Carlos and Anna, if they look at each other, right, they can tell that they're being moved apart by a velocity v. It doesn't matter which frame of reference they're sitting in, right? So you could be you could be Anna in frame S, or you could be Carlos in frame S prime, and both of you will measure, for instance, that the distance between you, roughly speaking, is going to be increasing, right, in time according to v delta t, whatever that delta t is, which that we'll get to that in a second. But um, so that's that's how these two frames are moving with respect to each other. And of course, you know, for instance, if Carlos, you know, throws a ball backward, right, like a baseball, based on your intuition, let's say, you know, he throws it at some speed, which we'll call V ball, you can figure out, oh, well, then the speed from Anna's point of view should just be, so when she sees V ball, which I'll call V ball Anna, right? She's going to see a different speed because, from her perspective, uh, standing still, I guess, you know, again, it's a relative thing, but standing still in her frame, she's going to see the ball moving toward her at what? At uh, V minus VB, right? And so, for instance, if Carlos, this is kind of weird to think about it, uh, if Carlos is traveling at some constant speed V and he throws the ball, and this is, this is intuitive, and, or at least you have the capability of seeing this with your eyes, but you may not have really noticed. If, if Carlos throws the ball behind him like that, from his perspective, moving at a constant velocity, and by the way, we're neglecting air resistance and all that kind of crap, so just, just think about what happens with, for instance, gravity and, and constant motion, constant velocity motion. So if Carlos throws the ball backward, he will, what will he see? He will see from his perspective everything, you know, as if he had just thrown it straight backward, and so it's going to make a parabolic arc toward the ground in his frame of reference. And in his frame of reference, right, in his coordinate system, S prime, how fast is the ball going? So VB Carlos, well, it's just VB, right? So, and, and we're taking the sign of VB here to indicate that it's going backwards. So from his perspective, he sees it moving at different velocity. And in fact, what that means is he'll see it do a, a parabolic arc. But then what if, he th what if he throws the ball backwards? What if VB is exactly equal to minus V? That is to say, it's exactly the re reverse of the velocity of the bike that he's sitting on. What will he see? He'll still see exactly the same thing. From his perspective, he'll throw the ball. The ball will sail through the air. You know, f let's say it's flat when he throws it at first. So it'll make the top part of a parabolic arc and then land on the ground behind him. And it'll look as if as any other experiment of throwing a ball would in a gravitational field. Um, what will Anna see? Well, if V minus VB and VB is equal to, you know, minus V, then she's going to see that when Carlos throws the ball, the ball actually stands still laterally, meaning it doesn't move over the ground, it just drops to the ground, right? It just looks like he just let go of it, basically, in her, ref in her reference frame. And that's kind of weird, but you can actually do that experiment. You can, you can go out right now and get your, be your bestie pandemic friends and uh, you know, try one of these experiments. So this is what we call, the, the way that I wrote the velocities here, like this thing and this thing, right? This is what we call a Galilean relativity situation. So this is, a, oops, 
Galilean. Actually, I'm gonna switch back to um, to orange here. Okay, Galilean relativity. Okay. Now, Galilean relativity is is this thing where basically you think to yourself, okay, there's no limit on how fast Carlos could be going. Maybe he's got a rocket booster on there. Who knows? Maybe he's got a lot of fuel, so he can go super super fast. Uh, and if he throws the ball backward at a speed vb, it's always just given by the simple addition rule that we have right there. It's it, it's the this is the intuitive version of things, right? This is what you think about when you think about cars moving and, you know, why you probably shouldn't jump out of a car that's 60 miles an hour because this ground speed relative to your frame is very high. So it looks like you're going to, you know, land on this fast-moving object, basically, which is the ground. And <clears throat> the final thing I want to say before we start really digging in here is this: these notions of relative velocities that we see here... Uh, they, they're, they're the one, that's one of the few things that these two observers can agree upon, right? Because, for instance, they will each see the other moving at a velocity v, which means the, there's like a symmetry there, and they can agree, yes, we are moving with respect v to each other, right? So that this velocity v that I denoted there, that's the velocity between Carlos and Anna, and they can agree on that number no matter what, including including when we start getting weird in just a moment. Okay, so Galilean relativity is like, this is, you know, pre-Einstein. Pre this is how we thought... Einstein. Uh, this is how we thought the world worked before Einstein came along. And it's not... And of course, it's, it's an approximation to the real thing, which we'll see in a second, but it works for very low speeds. So specifically, Galilean relativity works when the velocity of whatever of the two frames or the objects, whatever you're considering, when the velocity divided by the speed of light is much, much less than one. When that's true, then you're in the intuitive zone. And that's what I was saying earlier, that, that special relativity only kind of becomes important when you're talking about very fast-moving objects. But of course, when you go out to like particle accelerators or stellar objects, you know, astronomical objects, you can get very fast-moving stuff, and so this will become uh, important. Okay, so now let's think about something. Okay, so <clears throat> there are two different kinds of reference frames. So when we talk about reference frames, there's what we'll call non-inertial, non-inertial reference frame, and there are Ta-da! Inertial reference frames. Inertial reference frames. So the picture that we drew a moment ago with Anna standing still and Carlos on a bike moving at constant velocity, those were that was an inertial reference frame. Both of those were inertial reference frames. What is a non-inertial reference frame? Well, I can give you some very simple examples. If you are taking off in a plane, so here's my extremely bad plane landing gear. Right? So the, the plane is not moving at a constant velocity. What if it's accelerating, which, of course, is exactly what happens when you take off? Right? So you, there's not just a velocity, there's actually an acceleration forward in the plane. If a person sitting on the plane, which I'll try my best to draw a teeny tiny stick figure there, puts a ball down, right? what's going to happen to the ball? Well, as it, when they let go of the ball, the ball will actually begin to accelerate backward. Right? Now that is something weird, right? in the sense that in a... If I was sitting on my porch and I put a ball down and it started to just roll across the porch and, it, and the porch was flat, for instance, so assume the plane is flat here too, uh, that should be worrisome to you, right? Because where is the force coming from to move the ball? Well, it's coming from the fact that you're not actually looking at physics in an inertial frame. So this is, this is non-inertial. So if there's inertial, what it ends up meaning is any frame, any frame moving oops, moving, at constant velocity, any velocity, we'll see in a second, constant velocity with respect to another inertial frame. Okay? So the two situations are cases where you're moving at some constant velocity, like moving in a car at a constant speed, or a train, or a plane, or any other vehicle, or rocket ship. You know, there are kind of only a few examples, or a bike. Uh, and situations where that's not true, where you have some acceleration, right? And so the reason we call this special relativity is because ultimately we're only going to be working, so special relativity, this is the special 
part of special relativity is because we're only going to be talking about inertial frames of reference, okay? Uh, Einstein later came up with uh, a theory called the general theory of relativity, and that handles the more complicated case, or cases, where you have non-inertial frames of reference. And uh, I may or may not, depending on my energy levels, uh, briefly, briefly um, talk about some principles that come from non-inertial reference frames. Okay, so you have these two inertial reference frames. We're only going to be talking about inertial reference frames. Okay, so things that are moving at constant velocity with respect to each other. And here's the funny thing. So let's take our plane example. And the plane is now taken off. So here's the ground, right? And here's what we're going to do. We're going to have, what did I say earlier? Anna, right? So Anna's here. Uh, Carlos is in the plane. I'm going to make the plane a little bigger now. And this cloud's up here. Okay. And uh, this thing is moving at a velocity v with respect to uh, between Anna and Carlos. So Carlos is standing in the plane. All right. Each of them, let's pretend, has a a lab, you know, in their respective areas. So Anna's got a you know workbench and she's got some equipment, you know, things that bubble. Who knows? And uh, Carlos has the same thing. He's got an identical lab. Okay. So identical lab, bubbles, whatever. They both have these two different labs. And let's think about what happens. So first off, if um, if Anna throws up a ball, so she gives some like little, actually I'll make the ball a different color. If Anna throws up a ball, let's say this blue ball, uh, with some initial speed, which I'll just for the moment, just, just for this example, call V, but we're gonna use V, you know, later. Um, She's gonna. She starts a stopwatch when the ball starts heading up, and then she measures it when it, you know, hits the ground. Right, hits where her feet are. And by the way, let's say that Anna and Carlos are the same height. So just to you know, clarify that. So she's gonna measure some delta t for this process. Right, she's gonna say she throws up the ball and she hears it smack hit the ground, and she says, "How long did that take?" And she'll get some delta t for that. Right, so she'll she'll have some delta t, which I will call. Uh, delta T prime here, just to distinguish it. And Carlos is going to do the exact same experiment. Carlos is going to uh, throw a ball upward at a speed V and measure when it hits the bottom of the of the underside of the plane there, you know, the floor of the plane. And he will get some delta T, which I have no prime there. Now, I hope it makes sense that Carlos can't even tell that he's in the plane. Let's say it's a windowless plane. From his perspective, what he sees is he's just in a box, there's no external forces acting on the box. He's just in a gravitational field. And the same thing with Anna. She's sitting outside, not in a box, but she's sitting outside, and gravity is acting on her, and you know, everything else is the same. So what it means is that delta T prime must equal delta T in these two instances, right, in, this, in these two cases. So any, and it turns out that that's true, right? Could, she could throw the ball and get a parabolic arc to the ball. Carlos could throw the ball, get a parabolic arc, and if they measured the shape of the arc, or they did any dynamical experiment, what they will find is that the laws of physics are the same in those two inertial reference frames. So this is the crazy, well not crazy, but this is the important part, crazy important part. So what relativity says is it says, and this is like the starred, you know, underlined thing, it says all of the laws of physics are identical in all inertial reference frames. Okay? That is the principle of relativity stated. Now, the crazy part is that's a, a relatively simple statement and it's really and it's quite precise. The implications of it are what take a minute to figure out like wait, what does that mean if that's true? And so that's where we're going to start is saying, okay, so we have this notion of an inertial reference frame, a frame in which it is moving at a constant velocity relative to any other inertial reference frame. And which doesn't necessarily mean it's moving in the same direction as every other inertial reference frame, by the way. We're going to stick to these kind of simple 1D-ish, like 1D motion examples. But, but everything I'm saying extends to uh, higher dimensions as well, to three dimensions. So you've got uh, this, this notion that in every reference frame that's inertial, the laws of physics are the same. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's redraw, or let me actually just copy my, um, my scenario here. And again, I'll kind of remove some things in a minute. Okay, copy, paste. Okay, so they've now determined in their two scenarios that 
the laws of physics are the same where they are. So I'm going to erase uh, these. They're, we're done with the ball experiment, okay? So ball experiment's over. Okay, great. There we go. All right. They're going to do a different experiment now. Each the same experiment. Everything about the experiments is the same. And of course, the whole point is they should get the same answer. So first experiment they're each going to do, I'll actually just draw each experiment once, but just imagine that this experiment is taking place in both places, even though they were moving relative to each other. So both of them are given uh, a charged object, which will just has a positive charge Q, let's say. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and this has some negative charge minus Q. And they're they're given a rig or whatever that puts them a certain distance apart at first, and then there's some way of measuring the force. So they're both going to they're both going to have these two charged objects, uh, obviously their own copy of the charged object, but everything about them, the mass, the um, the charge itself, etc., is the same. And so if they measure the force, either of them, what are they going to find? They're going to find one over four pi epsilon naught q q is going to be minus sign there over d squared, right? So they're both going to measure Coulomb's force law, right? So this is the Coulomb force. Coulomb force, right? They're both going to measure that. So they have a force measuring device, so they can know F. They were given Q and Q, and they, of course, can measure D, which means now they have one equation, and they can solve for what epsilon zero is. So that means that both of them, both, both uh, Anna and Carlos, agree on the value of epsilon zero, right? And remember, this is a fundamental constant of nature. And what it's saying is not only is it the same everywhere in the universe, not only can you go anywhere, but also the fact that we're saying that all inertial reference frames have the same laws of physics means that also any relative state of motion would measure the same fundamental constant. Okay? So this thing, this epsilon zero, they've now measured it, and they've gotten some number, right? This is some number. Okay? And you, you, we can look it up later if you want. Um, so they, they both do this experiment, and they measure the value of uh, the, the permittivity of free space, epsilon zero. Okay, so they have that number now. And they've figured out this new universal constant, not new, but they, for them new, they figured out this universal constant of, of the law of attraction, for instance, in this case between um, charged bodies. Then they decide to do a second experiment. So this is experiment one. Experiment one. Then they decide to do a second experiment, experiment two. Only two experiments here. And the second experiment, and by the way, both of these should look familiar, right? We did uh, Coulomb's force law, and we're, we did the thing I'm about to describe. Hold on, I just spilled some LaCroix on my iPad. Okay, yeah, yeah that's good enough. Whatever, it'll evaporate. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the second experiment? So the second experiment is that they each have an identical wire, and with the appropriate uh, EMF and resistor, yada, yada, they're sending some current up the wire. They're sending the exact same amount of current, I. Okay? So they're sending the exact same amount of current, I. Based on the right-hand rule here, we know that this is going to wrap a B field around that wire. right? So this will be the, the B field. And we know that, and let's pretend they each have a device that measures uh, B, which, you know, so something you can measure the Tesla, the, the number, the strength of magnetic field in space. All right, and so each of them is going to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to measure B, let's say the magnitude of B, and that magnitude is going to be related to uh, mu I over 2 pi R, if I remember correctly, and where R is, of course, the distance away from the wire. So each of them can do this experiment and say, I'm going to measure B, I know I, I know R, because I can just measure it right there in the experiment, so I can, again, figure out what this fundamental constant must be, so I can measure mu zero. And what that means is so they can both, both Anna and Carlos agree on the value of mu zero, right? And they're going to get some number, some number. Great. So we're totally self-consistent here. We've just said the laws of physics are the same. So when they measure something like Coulomb's force or the magnetic field around a current carrying wire, they're going to get the same number, right? And that should make sense. And we learned, and, and if you want to know where this actually comes from, I'll say it's from Maxwell's equations, and that's dealing with uh, fairly complex uh, partial differential equations that we do not have the tools to delve into. But suffice it to say, from Maxwell's equations, 
um, we learned that the speed of light is given by 1 over the square root of mu0 zero epsilon 0. Okay, So the speed of light is given by the product of these two, or the you know, inverse square root product, of these two fundamental constants that both of them can measure, which means both it means that both Anna and Carlos um, will measure will measure the same value for c for the speed of light, right? Independent, independent of their relative motion, right? So that's the weird part. If that if that slipped by you, let me repeat that again. What it's saying is, we talked about the baseball, or whatever ball it was up here. Where'd it go? Here. We talked about this ball that's being thrown here. If I throw a ball and, and it's moving, and you know, there's two moving frames, I get these differences in velocity of perception of the ball. Carlos sees the ball going one speed. Anna sees the ball going a slightly different speed, right? That's not what's happening here. What's, what here it's saying is, oh, regardless of how they're moving, they both measure the speed of light to be the same. Which, again, should strike you as a little bit odd. It means that light, in general, is somehow different from regular matter, which maybe isn't too surprising, but uh, that is what, as part of what it's saying. There's actually a deeper statement there, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. So they will both measure the same value for the speed of light, independent of the relative motion. So this is, if we're circling things here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little, let's use uh, bright green. This is important statement number one. And it really, this is just a follow-up from that, but but essentially this is important statement number two, which is that they're both going to measure the same C. And, and of course, there's nothing special about Anna and Carlos. It could be any other reference frame, as long as it's inertial. Everybody is going to measure the speed of light to be the same because the laws of physics are the same in all these instances, and the way we and the way the speed of light is found with that formula that's up there uh, in the middle of the page right now just asks you to know what mu zero and epsilon zero are. So everyone's going to see the same speed of light which is a little weird, and let's figure out why uh, that's a little bit weird. Okay, I think, I think we're on track here. I have some notes that I'm kind of loosely trying to follow, so if I go quiet for a second, it's because I'm trying to figure out either where I messed up or, you know, how things are going, basically. Okay, so we're going to do a little algebraic calculation here, and we're going to see something uh, which is just sort of undeniably strange. And again, this is where... Uh, this is where your intuition will absolutely be broken because you have never seen anything. You've never really experienced anything like this, but fast objects do. So we're going to talk about uh, this example called the light clock. Light clock. Okay. So what is the light clock? All right. So you got the ground. I'll put it up here. There's the ground. We're going to have a cart. Uh... Is able to roll, give it an end in the beginning. We're going to have Anna. She's standing on the ground. She's still. So this is Anna. Put an A in her head. And Carlos is standing also still. So she's standing still in this frame, right? So she's, she's stationary with respect to the ground. And Carlos, let's give this thing a velocity V. Carlos is moving in this cart at a constant velocity V, and he is stationary in the frame of the cart, right? So Carlos. And what Carlos has set up on the cart is the following, um, I guess we'll call it, you know, object or whatever. And what it is, is basically there's a little place, there's a little place uh, where, let's see, we'll have a mirror. So this thing is going to be a mirror, a perfect mirror. That's a mirror. And this is uh, something that ticks, basically. So it's got a clock inside of it. Let me, let me put the clock down here. All right, so the clock there, and what it's going to do is it's going to emit a little infinitesimal, you know, a very, very fast pulse of light. So the light's going to travel. It's going to bounce. I'm going to have to, obviously, I can't go back over the exact same spot, so I'll go over a little bit. It's going to bounce, and it's going to head back. Right? Boom. Like that. And so what you can imagine is that, uh, you know, the, the moment that the pulse is emitted, a stopwatch begins, and when the pulse returns, the stopwatch stops, right? So let's think about how much time goes by for Carlos for this ticking. If you want to think, of it, if you want to think of it, you can think of it as like tick tock, right? So how much time does a tick tock take in this light clock? Sounds like how many 
How much wood could a woodchuck chuck? How, how, lo- how much time does a TikTok take on a light clock? Is the question that we're trying to ask, but the diff- we're going to find is that the answer is different for the different observers. So let's think about Carlos's position. So in Carlos's frame, let's call this distance L. Okay, so in Carlos's frame, what does he see? He sees that the light travels a distance 2L, right, up and down, 2L, and he obviously it's a pulse of light, and everyone agrees on the speed of light, so it travels at a speed C, and therefore it takes a time delta T. So that's the very simple equation for what uh, his measurement of distance, time, and the speed of light looks like. Pretty straightforward, okay? Now let's look at Anna. What does Anna see? And of course I can't draw exactly over Carlos, so I'll just draw it over here. What Anna sees is, from her perspective, is the moment that the thing emits the light, the car is traveling. So it actually, the, in her case, the beam of light hits the mirror down the down the road a little bit, and then it reflects back and comes back to where it started. And so her TikTok has a slightly different look to it, right? What does she see? So she remember this distance. This distance is L, and then the question is, what's this distance? Well, they both agree on V. And she's got some delta t, which I'm going to call delta t prime. Okay, so how long is the path in this scenario? Well, the length of the path. Uh, let's calculate. So this is a right triangle, right? Right triangle. Let's calculate that. So the bottom leg on the bottom side there, that's v delta t prime over two, and we want to get the hypotenuse here. So we're going to square that. We're going to add l squared. We're going to square root. And we're going to call that L prime. That's the hypotenuse there. So that's L prime, right? So it's just the Pythagorean theorem applied to this situation, all right? So now we have L prime. And of course, the equivalent notion that we wrote for Carlos, the one that we wrote for Anna, is we say, well, 2L prime equals C delta T prime, okay? So it looks exactly the same, except there's primes over the L and the T. And you can already see what's going to happen here. What's the one thing, or there's two things technically, but what's the one thing that they absolutely can both agree on because they are both in inertial reference frames? The one thing that they can agree on is C. C is the same in both instances, right? That's the one thing that they can agree on. So now let's follow the logic of that statement that they must both be the same. So first off, we're just going to do, I'm going to kind of work through a bunch of algebra here, uh, but it's, you know, it's just algebra. So either you, you can either do it yourself to convince yourself, or you can just believe the result that I get at the end and assume that I did it correctly, which I did because I checked many times. Okay, so first off, I'm just going to take this guy, okay, and I'm going to write it as 2L because, of course, we already have a 2L, so I want to kind of get that into the right form. Uh, you can write that as 2L quantity squared plus v delta t prime squared. And by the way, just so we're clear, uh, so I don't forget at any point, remember that Anna is going to be standing in s prime and Carlos is in s. So all the variables that have primes on them go with Anna, and all the variables that don't have primes go with Carlos, okay? All right. <clears throat> all right, so we got that. Uh, let's see here. Na, 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 na. So let's set this, so now we, we can actually solve for, uh, we can plug this into this equation, so we can say that um, we can solve this guy right here, oops, solve this guy right here, and so we can say 2L prime over delta T prime equals C, and we can also do the same thing here, we can say 2L over delta t equals c. So now we're going to set those two things equal because those are the things that we know must be the same, that the speed of light is the same in the two uh, reference frames. So that means that 2L over delta t equals 2L prime over delta t prime, right? Simple statement, but of course this is where things get tricky. So let's uh, sub in this guy up here. So we're going to write 2L quantity squared. Notice that this is L prime and this is not L prime, right? And you can see where that comes from in the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so that is 2L over delta T prime. Okay, so got all those pieces. Uh, let's see, I gotta get all my like little little bits. So the the other thing I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually pull out a factor of, this is all just algebra, I'm gonna pull out a factor of 2L so that's going to leave me with what? That's going to leave me with 1. 
I'll put the delta t here. 1 plus v delta t prime over 2l quantity squared. And when I look at this, v over 2l, what is that equal to? So if I go, make sure I got my pieces here. So I, I already know that uh, c equals 2l over delta t, 2l over delta t. That came from Carlos's point of view. And so I can just substitute in that 2L equals C delta T into there. And what is that going to give me? Notice that I can cancel, if I rewrite this again, 2L over delta T, right, from there. So the 2Ls cancel. That's great. I'm going to multiply that other delta T over. So I'm going to get delta T prime over delta T. Now I've got 1 plus V delta t prime, and then the 2L is going to be C delta t, C delta t, quantity squared, square root. Now I'm going to square both sides, so this is all just algebra, square both sides, we're going to get delta t prime over delta t, quantity squared equals 1 plus V over C, quantity squared times delta t prime over delta t squared, right? And finally, we're almost there. I know it's like a series of steps here, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this, which is that, you know, theoretical physics calculations often take, uh, <laughs> shall we say, many pages. I mean, like, oftentimes a lot. We're going to multiply both sides by the same thing, which is a totally reasonable thing to do. So we're just gonna, I'm just going to flip things over. That's all I'm doing here. So I'm going to multiply both sides by delta t over delta t prime squared. So I'm just going to multiply the right-hand side and the left-hand side by the same thing. That's fine. And when I do that, finally, what will I get? I'll get 1 equals uh, delta t over delta t prime quantity squared plus v over c quantity squared. And then finally, I'm going to just rearrange and move things around and solve for that ratio of delta t's. And actually, I'll go down. And what I will find is that uh, delta t over delta t prime equals 1 minus v over c quantity squared square root. And then finally, I'll write it this way, delta t prime delta t 1 minus v over c quantity squared. Okay, so that's our first big result. And let me explain to you what it is telling you. It's saying something actually pretty pretty striking. It's saying this. So now, remember, this is a light clock, and so both of them have a stopwatch in their hand. I'll draw their little, let me draw the stopwatch. So, you know, they both got a stopwatch in their hand, and they're both measuring the time that it takes the light to be emitted, bounce off the mirror, and come back to the place where it was emitted. And, we, and they both have a notion of how far it went based on what they saw, and they both know that the speed of light is constant, which is c, and we know that value. So what that means, literally, and this is the crazy, crazy part, and if, as I said, if this seems strange, well, welcome to relativity, right? That's, <laughs> that's what's going on. Um, so first off, let me actually show a few things. One, if v over c, remember we said that that's the kind of where we normally live, v over c much, much less than 1, well, if that's much, much less than 1, and you square it, then it gets even smaller, and then 1 minus a very, very, very small number is about 1, which means that when v over c is much, much less than 1, that delta t prime approximately equals delta t. Right? So in the scenario where things are slow moving, you would never notice a difference in the way that their clocks ticked. They would, it would tell you that the delta t is the same. Right? Uh, and by the way, you can, for instance, you could do this with a, like a two events you know, on a plane versus the ground, and even at hundreds of meters a second, that's still such a small fraction of the speed of light that you, you, know, you don't see any, any real difference in the ticking of the clocks. Um, by the way, when these this process of the change in time becomes important, oh crap, what did I do, uh, is for instance in GPS. So that, that's one, and any kind of space travel, uh, even, even space travel that we do now. So what is this telling you? It's telling you that from the perspective of the two same events, 
the event was, and so this is an important definition now, we're adding something, we're adding this notion of an event. And what do I mean by an event? I mean, there was a moment, an event, wherein um, Carlos's frame, the pulse got emitted, bounced, and came back. So those are the two events. It was the emission and the return were the two events. Anna also sees the same two events, the emission, bounce, and return, right? And those are the two events that she sees. And the crazy part is those are the same events, right? It's the They're seeing it from different perspectives, but the physical reality is that they're the same exact thing is happening. They're, it's the same, not just identical, but it's the same event. And the crazy part with this is telling you is that the measured time that they have for those two events is different, right? That's the crazy part. And so specifically, to get to get more specific here, the measurement that Carlos has, which is the is this guy, that's Carlos's measurement of time. Well, it turns out that uh, Anna's measure of time will be longer. She will see those same two events as being spread farther apart in time than Carlos does. Okay. And the last thing here that's very important is to define this thing called proper time. So it turns out, sheesh, I got to hold on a second. I'm going to get rid of that. Where's the little, there we go. Okay. Oh, no, 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 damn it. Just like other times, you know, uh, this is all done in one take, so. Okay, so, um, where are we here? That kind of just broke my train of thought. Uh, so we're looking at this, at these differences in time, and the point is that the clocks are literally ticking at different rates in these two frames of reference. And in a sense, you, know, you can think of it different ways, but that is because the laws of physics are set up in such a way as to maintain the constancy of the speed of light. Both of them agree then what the speed of light is, and that forces time to pass at a different rate in the two different frames, is uh, one way of kind of thinking about it. So now there's, there is something interesting here, which is, you could say, well, which time is correct? You could say, right? And you say, well, there's no correct time. Both of them are valid in their frames of reference. However, there is something called the proper time. So what is the proper time? So we define this notion of a uh, proper time. So it's the technical term, proper time, right? And that is the time between events that take place in the same position in an inertial reference frame. So, in other words, Carlos is standing on the cart that is stationary. The clock is, of course, stationary in the cart. He's stationary in the cart. So in his field of view, there were two events, and those events took place here. Well, let me make a better color. Sorry. Those two events took place here and here again. So they took place at the same position in his frame of reference at two different times. So Carlos measures the proper time. So in other words, this is proper time. And the, it's not that it's the correct time, it's just that the, it's the time that everyone can agree on. Everyone can agree that Carlos is standing in a reference frame that is both inertial and stationary with respect to those two events, hence they're happening in the same position. And so everyone can agree on what time Carlos should calculate in his frame of reference. And so because it has this sort of special property that everyone can agree on it, we call that proper time, okay? And so this is not proper time, all right? said differently. Now again, this is actually what uh, Anna would measure on the ground in terms of the time between those two identical events. And notice that no matter what V is, uh, as long as it's below C, no matter what V is, uh, the proper time is always shorter than the non-proper time, than the time measured in another reference frame. So in other words, it is always the case that the proper time, I'll call it uh, delta T proper, P there, that the proper time is always less than or equal to the not proper time, okay? That's always the case. And so the shortest time between events is always in the frame of reference where those two, where the events are stationary, okay? All right, so that's the notion of proper time. Now, there's another weird thing that happens too. So, so to be clear, you know, this is happening in the real world right now. The difference is you're operating here. You're operating 
uh, cars and planes and all that stuff are so slow that you never see the difference. However, once you start getting to very fast things, it starts to make a difference. And by the way, I've included a set of slides with this um, iPad presentation. Uh, those are the slides that we kind of normally use uh, from the same makers, and I, I, which I heavily modify in general, but I still use them, uh, the base set of slides. And one, they're very long, which is part of the reason why I decided to do it myself here, because I thought it could be a little more streamlined. Uh, they do go through a lot more kind of examples and checkups. So if you're really like interested and want to learn about special relativity, I do recommend going through those slides. And in particular, I also talk about some specific examples of where this comes into play. So for instance, one of them is that um, the sun is throwing off high energy particles all the time that are raining down Earth. And we talked about some of these as what causes the aurora borealis, etc. Um, some of those particles are not your standard you know, neutron, proton, electron particles. There's another particle called a muon, which is a cousin of the electron, so to speak, uh, much more massive. And these muons have a very short lifetime. Like, they don't, they're not stable in nature, and so they, they get formed, and then they break down. And the interesting thing is that if that was happening when a muon got formed in our atmosphere at a, at a high rate, uh, usually a gamma ray comes in, for instance, and creates one, which is also due to relativity, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, we know it that in the rest frame of the muon, its half-life, meaning how long it takes to, to break down into just um, to new stuff, to, to energy, the half-life, I think it was, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was like a microsecond and a half, 1.5 microseconds. However, if you calculate the speed that they're going and multiply that by 1.5 microseconds, it's not long enough, it's not enough distance to ever reach the ground from the atmosphere. It's too, sh it's too uh, short. But we see tons of muons reaching the ground, and the reason why is that in their frame of reference, their clock is ticking, like their physics clock is ticking slower than ours, and the result is that in their ticking frame, they have enough time to make it to the surface of the Earth, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, but that's actually true. Okay, so proper time, time, and this, this whole concept, I should point out, this whole thing, this is called, this thing is called time dilation. Time dilation. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Got to drink my, stay hydrated. Okay, so next we're going to talk about uh, another sort of funny thing that uh, happens with relativity. And we're going to do basically three or four like little mini topics like this. So that was number one. Let's start, let's draw another example. And this, I'll just get to the chase here and say we're going to call this length, length contraction. So time dilation and length contraction are kind of these sister concepts. All right. So one, once again, let's draw Anna. She's down here. We've got our ground. And we got a cart, cart, okay. And forget about the light clock, no more light clock, but uh, Carlos is still standing, Carlos. And what we have here is that on the ground, there is a, a cone, okay. Right, and the cone, so what's gonna happen is they're each gonna try to determine uh, how long the cart is, right? So the question is, in some sense, how long is the cart? Right, and they know again. They can agree on this. They know that the car is moving at a speed v. Okay, so the car is moving at a speed v, and both of them can see. I mean, if you want, you could imagine that they're you know arbitrarily close. So the measurement of when this happens is arbitrarily good. But the point is, they can both see when. Let me do a different color. They can both see the moment when the front of the cart and the cone line up. And of course, conversely, when it, as it rides by, they'll see another moment when the back of the cart and the cone lines up. So those are the two events, right? Those are the two events. Now, let's start by noticing that the event, which is, so event one, I shall just write it, make it clear. So event one equals uh, front, front of cart passing cone. All right, and event two, event two, uh, back of cart passing cone. All right, so those are the two events. This is cone, believe it or not. There you go, good enough. And <clears throat> what are they going to do? So they're going to look at this uh, scenario, and they're they're each going to have, of course, uh, 
a different measurement. That's what the point is here. So in uh, Carlos's rest or Carlos's rest frame, what does he see? Well, he sees there's some length of the cart, and that is given by v times the, the time change uh, that he that he measures between those two events. So there's a delta t. This is you know t of event uh, two minus t of event one. Right. That's the the delta t here is the time between the two events, which specifically is the the passing of the cones of the cone, and Anna, she sees you know essentially the same thing is true right. She has L prime equals V delta T prime right. And remember the reason that we're using the primes here. The primes are the uh, S and S prime. I think I was consistent. Yes, maybe. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So now let's think about what's actually going to happen here, which again, as you might imagine, is going to be different. And who's first off, who's measuring the proper time? They both see, and of course, this is the same thing. It's the difference between the event times. But who's measuring proper time here? So the event takes place right here, right? And Anna is standing still with respect to the cone, which is where the event takes place. So Anna is measuring proper time, OK? And Carlos is not, because Anna is seeing the two events in the frame of reference in which they are stationary with respect to her. That's what makes it proper time. So uh, in this case, what we mean, what I mean to say is that delta t prime is equal to delta t proper. And delta t, in this case, is equal to delta t not proper. Okay. And now if we go back to our uh, earlier equation, what did we write? We wrote that delta t not proper equals delta t proper over square root 1 minus v over c quantity squared. OK. So, and I use the prime up here, but uh, just recognize that when I, you know, prop, one's proper time, one's not. OK. So let's uh, just divide these two equations. Right? Let's just uh, see what's going to happen here. So first, let me write the fraction. It's delta t not prime over delta t prime, uh, proper is 1 over square root 1 minus v over c quantity squared, like that, right? So just, just took the ratio there, that's all. I'm just going to divide the two equations for their length. So one's going to say, I'll go back to orange, one's going to say uh, L equals v uh, delta t not proper, right? That's the equation for Carlos. And Anna sees, I'm just divide both sides, L prime over v delta t proper, right? That's just taking the ratio of two equations, totally allowed to do that. That's, that's a reasonable uh, thing. Or conversely, if you want to think of it differently, you can just think of you're solving this equation for v and this equation for v and setting them equal. It's exactly the same process. OK, so clearly the v's are going to cancel, which makes good sense. Whatever is about to happen, it probably should not depend on the exact value of the, uh, um, the relative velocity, although that's a half truth. So let's look at this ratio. So now we have L over L prime equals, and look at this ratio. It's exactly this ratio, right? Um, OK. And that means that uh, this is going to equal 1 over square root 1 minus v over c quantity squared. OK, so and then finally, I'm just going to rearrange this to say L prime equals L times square root 1 minus v over c quantity squared. OK, so this guy, this is the length contraction formula. So this is length, length contraction. OK, and what does that tell you? Well, think of what it means is that when they each measure the length as defined by the time between events and the velocity that they both agreed upon, they get different lengths. And that's another crazy thing. So literally, the dimensions of space and time are changing as you move. right? So we measure the time dilation. That's time being warped by movement. And this is space being warped by movement. And by the way, we won't, of course, get into this deeply, but unifying the notion of time and space into a single understandable kind of geometric construction is what one of is really the heart of Einstein's contribution to physics. I mean that's that's at the heart of it. Okay. So this is length contraction and what's what's literally saying is 
the length of objects is changing depending on the observer, depending on the relative frame, relative motion between their frames of reference. And I want to be, be clear here, just like with the clock example, with time dilation, this difference in time has nothing to do with the clocks. It has everything to do with the fact that literally the way that time passes is changing for relative observers. And so in other words, there's nothing wrong with the clocks. That's not why there's some time difference here. And similarly, there's nothing wrong with their clocks here for the same reason. And so this is not like, oh, there's some force squishing the cart. You know, you wouldn't feel anything on the cart or, or with respect to uh, Carlos, for instance. Carlos doesn't feel a force squishing him smaller so that he looks smaller to Anna. That's not what's happening. What's happening is that space itself is actually changing in such a way to create differences in the measured length between reference frames. So that's the concept of uh, length contraction. Now, uh, this is actually going pretty pretty quickly and good, which I'm, I'm pleased with. Unfortunately, I don't... Um, Let's do a quick recap, actually, before I get to the next topic. So all of this stemmed from those two postulates, or whatever you want to call them, notions here. One is that the laws of physics are identical in all initial reference frames. Okay, that makes sense, and it matches our intuition. And that leads to the notion that the value of C is independent of relative motion. Everyone will measure it to be the same. And by the way, one of the things that contributed to this worldview, about, and one of the, the experimental proofs, was previously people thought, oh, light must travel in some kind of medium, because every other wave travels in a medium, right? Sound travels through air or any other gas. Uh, water waves travel on the surface of water, right? And there are tons of other examples. So so earthquake waves you know, travel through ground as their medium, right? So in almost every other situation, or a string, another example, you pluck a string, the string is the medium, right? It's an elastic medium. So everything else seems to have this you know, a medium and then a propagation in that medium. And so people are like, well, what's the propagation medium for light? And every equa or every experiment that's been done since then has confirmed that there is no medium that light is propagating. People thought there was a medium, they called it ether. And the way they tested for this was actually pretty interesting. So they thought to themselves, okay, let's pretend there's some unfeelable fluid through which light is actually propagating, you know, called the ether. You can't you know, it's hard to know. Can you, like, get a jar of it? You know, does it weigh something? What's, you know, what is this stuff, right, if it's there? And the experiment, which is called the Michelson-Morley experiment, was, basic, was basically the following, which is they fired one beam of light, and they, they did the light clock experiment, actually. They fired one beam of light in uh, one direction of movement around the sun, and the other, so let me, actually, let me show you. I'll just draw this picture. <clears throat> so if you imagine that this is the sun, and the Earth is, you know, going around the Sun, right? They fired one beam of light, th and the, the idea is, like, here's the ether, right? It's the stuff sitting out here. And so, in some sense, just like with water or sound or anything else, there should be, like, drag, basically, against the medium. So, for instance, if I fired a light, uh, a photon in this direction, I should see it move at different speed than if I fired it in this direction, because in one case, I'm firing sort of into the ether wind, in one case, I'm firing sort of, so to speak, with the ether wind, if you will. And so you should see a difference in velocities of light, and the answer is they don't. And everything that we've ever done since then also confirms that. So this is one of the strong pieces of evidence that suggests that there is no ether. There is no substance through which this, uh, these electromagnetic disturbances, photons, are traveling. They are inherent... I mean, this is the crazy part, and it's, it's hard to, like, wrap your mind around it. But photons are inherent excitations of space-time. I mean, that's that's an, not an incorrect way to say it, but it doesn't mean it's particularly illuminating because they'll get like, what? But that is, that is an accurate description. They are, like, a property of how time and space are structured. That's what they... That's, they don't need a medium. They are kind of the base. Okay, so let's go on to two other quick things. I want to talk about velocity and E equals mc squared. So... We, we unfortunately do not have the full mathematical or physical tools yet in this class to de novo, from, from scratch, derive E equals mc squared. We can, however, realize that what Einstein figured out, Ein, what, did he, what did he figure out, is that the total energy, which I'll call E tote, of an object is equal to mc squared over square root 1 minus v over c quantity squared. Okay, so that that is that's his real insight. E equals mc squared is actually a less important result than this. This is the real deal. This is the thing that tells you something interesting. 
more so even than um, than e equals mc squared. So first off, what you can see is, and you might say to yourself, what is e tote? Well, e tote is going to be <coughs> any other. It's going to be kinetic energy, and basically, if you want to think of it as, you can think of potential as well. And so, if you if you write this out. <clears throat> notice a few things. One is, if the if the particle comes to a stop, whatever you're talking, it could be a particle, it could be a baseball, it could be a, a spaceship. If it comes to a stop and v equals zero, then it tells you, well, if it comes to a stop, then Ke, the kinetic energy, by definition, that's what the three equal sign means, is zero. So by definition, at, at rest, it's zero. And yet, that means that there's some, essentially, additional potential energy, but when you plug in zero over here, meaning up here, what you get is mc squared. So what that tells you is that the rest, so at rest, the total energy is equal to mc squared. That is to say, the virtue by virtue of having mass at all, things have energy, have potential energy, if you want to think of it that way. And that is, you know, that's e equals mc squared right there. And just to be clear about what that means, it literally means that there's, it means a few things, I and mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that. Uh, but it means that the... Um, <clears throat> that massive objects can be converted into energy, and energy can be converted into massive objects. And that's kind of weird. I mean, it's not kind of weird. It is weird when you think about it. And at first, you might think to yourself, oh, this breaks the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of energy. Well, it doesn't break them. It actually unites them is the right way to look at it. It tells you that there's some other thing that's conserved that actually encompasses both of those other conservation laws, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So... Now the question is, if, if this is true, if e tote equals ke plus pe, and pe equals mc squared, right? Well, that's interesting because where where do we get, we know that ke in Newtonian mechanics is, you know, one half mv squared, right? So how do we get from this thing down to this, right? That's, that's our first question. And they talk about in the book um, the binomial approximation. So just this is a quick math aside, binomial approximation. And it's just a way to, to approximate formulas. So for instance, if you do 1 plus x to the n, as long as uh, x is small, then this is approximately equal to 1 plus um, nx, right? I think I got that right. I always forget the sign there. I think, yeah, I think I got that right. So if we just apply that to the 1 over square root 1 minus v over c squared, what we figure out is that for low velocities, e tote is what? It's mc squared times 1 uh, plus v 1 half v over c quantity squared, like that. So in other words, this thing at low velocities turns into that thing, okay? And now we multiply this out, what do we see? We see mc squared plus one-half mv squared. So classic kinetic energy is retrieved plus this new term which comes from the rest mass of the particle. So this m, you maybe have heard this term before, we refer to this as the rest mass. It's kind of like the proper mass, if you want to think of it that way. It's, it's actually basically exactly that. So this is the quote-unquote rest mass that we're talking about. So in other words, E equals mc squared is a special case of a more general formula, and that general formula encapsulates what we already know about um, kinetic energy at low velocity. So in other words, Newton's, what this tells you is that Newton's equations of motion um, are, are true, and you know you get classic kinetic energy at low speeds, but actually once you get into very high speed regimes, i.e. near the speed of light, you have to think of it like this. You can't think of it like this anymore. Okay, and let's see what that what I mean by that. Uh, let me explain it a little bit better. <clears throat> so if we subtract off, um, what we can what we can look at here is basically say, okay, I've got e tote, right? So e tote has I'm going to divide e tote by mc squared, okay? So we're going to divide the total energy by the rest mass energy. That's going to give us, this is how physicists would think about this, by the way. So let's think here. So we're going to have this axis, and then on this axis, we're going to draw the velocity relative to the speed of light. So the highest it can go, and you can kind of see this up here. Let's see what happens. If v is zero, no big deal. If v is 
a negative number that's less than minus c, no big deal. If v gets close to 1, okay, that's going to get, or sorry, v over c gets close to 1, meaning v gets close to c, this thing is going to be 1 minus 1. That's bad, right, because that's going to give you uh, a 0 in the denominator, which means that the total energy is going to get very high, right? So basically, the faster something gets as it approaches the speed of light, the more energy it has. That in itself, as a qualitative statement, is not surprising, because that's what regular kinetic energy would happen too, right? Regular kinetic energy would say the faster you're going, the more energy you have. But the way that that happens is very different between the two theories, between low-speed Newtonian theory and, so to speak, high-speed Einsteinian you know, special relativity, right? And that's what I'm trying to plot down here. So you could be at zero velocity, which I will put here as zero. And, of course, now if you go to zero, you have, still have mc squared, right? So that means down here, you're going to start at one, because what it's saying is that at zero velocity, the e-tote is mc squared, so mc squared of mc squared is one. So basically, and I'll use a different color here, this is where this graph begins, right? It's right there at that point. Now, I'm actually going to move this down so I can draw a little better. There we go. Okay, now notice there's what we call an asymptote in math. That is to say, I can't go above v over c equals 1, right? In other words, I can't go above, so v cannot be greater than c, right? In fact, really, v can't even be equal to c. It actually has to be, strictly speaking, the laws of physics are such that uh, v must be less than or equal to c for all. That is the cosmic speed limit. So really, the speed of light is the co is, you know is the cosmic speed limit. It's nothing can travel faster than that cosmic speed limit. Okay, and what do I mean by this asymptote? Well, let's think about what happens up here. As I start raising the velocity, right? Let's go back. Let's actually copy it that way. I don't have to keep going up here. So here's our formula, that's what we're trying to plot. And if you want to, you know, make it more exactly what we have here, then it looks like this. And then this looks like that. So that's what we're plotting. This is the y-axis, and this is the x-axis down here, right? That's what, we're, that's what we're plotting against. And notice what happens here as we do this. So it starts speeding up, and the energy is going to look essentially parabolic. Right, and then all of a sudden, actually, let's go back to our pink color. Okay, and then as it approaches over here, it's gonna it's gonna rise up and it's never gonna hit that line. It's just gonna keep going up and keep getting closer and keep getting closer and keep getting closer and keep getting closer. Right, and so what it tells you is that you can put in arbitrarily high amounts of energy, and all that will happen is you'll get you'll approach the speed of light, but you'll never actually get there. Right, so. This is what we mean when we say it's the speed limit, because it would take, in order to even get to the speed of light for any massive particle, it would take an infinite amount of energy to do that. So we, that is why it's the cosmic speed limit, right? Because in order to get to C, forget about above C, just to C would take uh, all the energy that exists and, and more, right? Even for an electron, even for something very light, because of how this relationship is structured, right? And by the way, as far as we can tell, you know, this is not an approximation. This is, as I said earlier, the real deal. This is really how nature structures the relationship between velocity and energy. Now, here's the crazy part that comes out of this. So, so now we have an understanding that, and by the way, if you're wondering what does this look like for Newtonian mechanics, well, Newtonian mechanics, well, let's go look at it. So New Newtonian mechanics, remember we just had that approximation. I'll write it in green here. That says approximately that mc squared plus one half mv squared, and if we um, let's let's put this into the form, so we say mc squared plus uh, one half mc squared v over c quantity squared. So those are equal things. Divide through to get your um, and I'm just going to divide through by mc squared again, just like we had for the same y-axis. You know, 1 plus 1 half v over c quantity squared. So here's your, again, your y, and there's your x. So if we were to look at this, it would, it would act differently. It would act the same for a while, just like I drew there, for low speeds. And then as 
there is no speed limit in that case. You can just keep getting higher and higher, and it's going to act like a parabola. It's going to go past this. So this high-speed regime, that's where things are breaking down with Newtonian mechanics, but things at low speeds look the same. Right? That's, that's why no one had ever noticed this until 1905, because no one had ever, well, A, thought about the implications of the speed of light being constant and the inertial reference frames, all the same laws of physics, but also no one had ever hurled anything at these crazy high speeds before. Now we have particle accelerators, and now we have um, measurements of astronomical events that do indeed deal with speeds that are you know, very close to the speed of light. In many cases, not just close, but, you know, 0.9999, you know, the speed of light, stuff like that. Um, and so what you can figure out is even if you wanted to take an electron and accelerate it, you know, I guess I should use the purple here. Let me get rid of these. Uh, you know, if you took an electron and you wanted to accelerate it to this, to, you know, 0.999c, which is, you know, like right against this axis, you know, right here, right? the amount of energy that would take would be huge, much more than the amount of energy it would take in Newtonian mechanics to do that, right? So that's that's another big, big difference. So now we see where equals mc squared comes from once you understand the total energy equation. And the last thing, uh, and of course we see also that, that the way energy couples to velocity is fundamentally different in relativity than it is in Newtonian mechanics, i.e. one half mv squared. And of course, as I said already, at low velocities, they look the same. That's the key part, and that's why no one noticed the difference initially. So um, I'll go on a one 30-second diatribe and tell you, I get all these, and basically every professor, physics professor does, I get all these emails from, I'll try to be charitable here, and say confused people about, like they think they've disproven Einstein. I, I literally have an email folder called crazies. Sorry, I guess I shouldn't have said that, but that is what it's called. And these people are... <laughs> you know, trying to tell me that they've figured out, you know, problems with Einstein's theory and that, you know, they have a different equation and, and none of it makes any sense, by the way. And primarily the big issue is the whole point is that Einstein's theory encompasses Newtonian mechanics. It's like a it's like an expansion of the idea. It's not a different idea. And so when someone says that there's disagreement there, it's like, well, you have to be able to put forth a theory, a hypothesis really, in this case, a hypothesis that not only predicts everything that Newtonian mechanics predicts and everything that Einsteinian mechanics predicts, but then you have to add something to that that's, that's new, and no one has actually been able to do that in 100 years, right? That's the, that's the bar. Okay, uh, we are getting pretty close to the end. I just want to say one other thing. So some really, really, really weird, <sighs> really, really weird things going on. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example of what this sort of means. So an example of how this energy comes into play. So first off, there's a lot of classic examples. When you take a uh, uranium nucleus, right, and you fire a neutron at it, so I'll give that an N for neutron, and you fire it at a very, very high speed, right, and you, you bash the uh, nucleus into two sub-pieces, what you will notice is that the mass, so this had some mass, which we'll call m0, this has some mass called m1, and this has some mass called uh, m2, and let's call this, this is the mass of the neutron. So if you look at, so this is the event. The event is the bashing, which I'll put as a dash line. The bashing occurs. This is, of course, a very, very, very rough model of uh, nuclear fission. What you will actually measure, which is crazy, is that m, mass of the neutron, plus the mass of the original, uh, I called it m0, sorry, plus the mass of the original nucleus does not equal the mass of the two things that come out, right? Basically, there's a mass difference, and it's because that mass difference has actually been converted into energy. So that is the crazy thing that Einstein really predicted, which is, of course, allowed nuclear weapons to be, and nuclear power, for that matter, to be developed. So this process, now let's go back to the rest mass here. So I'm just going to write as E instead of E tote. E equals mc squared. This thing is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, of course, squared, which means this is something that's proportional to 10 to the 17th. That's a huge multiplier, right? That's a big number to multiply any mass by to get an energy out. So in other words, the conversion little itty itty bits of mass produce massive amounts of energy when they're converted and an example slightly morbid one sorry but it's also just focusing on the physics not the history uh the first bomb that was dropped on japan 
during World War II. I always forget which which one's which, fat man or little boy. But anyway, um, that first bomb, if I remember the number correctly, converted 0 0.7 grams of matter into energy. Energy. And that, so in other words, the conversion of 0 0.7 grams by the processes that we're talking about here was enough energy to level an entire city. Let that sink in for a second. So, you know, that's pretty crazy, right? Uh, now, the other thing that's really weird here is, and this will be the final, one of the final, I'll probably do kind of a quick review when we're done here, but the other thing that's really crazy here is the following. So this is example number one. And you can go, uh, you know, look up the fusion reaction that's happening in the core of the sun, and, and, and there's a mass difference there too, and that mass difference is converted to energy, and that's what heats the sun, causes it to give off black body radiation, which is why there's light on Earth. So literally, E equals mc squared is the reason why stars, in some sense, are hot. I mean, there's, there's a nuclear reaction taking place that's actually converting mass into energy. And that is the energy that's producing the light and the heat that comes off of the star, including our sun. So this is, you know, again, it may seem esoteric, like we're doing some esoteric calculation here, but on, on the, the actuality is that this is underlying all, you know, some of the most important processes that make life possible on Earth. Now, the other funny thing I'll tell you here is something really kind of kind of weird. And you'll, I hope it'll still make sense, though. So imagine I've got a charge. This is example two. Example number two, and I'll I think I'll stop and then do a review, and that'll be it. So imagine I've got a um, a plus charge and uh, a another plus charge, and the same charge, right? And the the same mass. They both got a mass m, right? So we've got some charge q, some mass m, and let's just say, of course, these two things want to get away from each other, right? So let's say there's a massless string that is able to hold these two. So there's, there's, a, there's a string, which I'll, mm, let's make it, I don't know, let's make it yellow. So there's a massless string that's holding these two things together, right? So it's under tension, basically, is the right way to think about it. And what does that mean? That means that the total energy of this system, right, is what? Well, it's, so the e tote for this system is obviously the uh, mass of each of the mc squared times 2 for each of the things. And if it's at rest, it's also got another form of potential energy, which is, of course, the, you know, capital K, Q squared over, and I forgot to give this a label, but let's call it D, some distance D, right? So we have a potential energy that's related there. And what that literally means is that if I try, so if, if you ask me, hey, I'm going to apply a force, and I want to know what the acceleration of this, this whole system is as I try to apply a force to move it, right? So I can, you know, whatever, I pick, I have these things, let's say, mounted on some board or whatever, or I don't know, maybe they're hanging, and I try to move it, and I say, what is, you know, and I, I apply a force, I measure an acceleration, and then I say, hey, what mass does the system correspond to? Well, in Newtonian mechanics, you apply the force, you know what that is, you measure the acceleration, so you know what that is, and so you get, you know, F, I guess I'll make them both vectors, gives you a mass. And that mass in Newtonian mechanics would just be what? It would just be 2m, right? That's it. However, here in, um, in Einsteinian mechanics, if you did the exact same experiment, you'll notice you have this new little bit of energy that's just coming from the fact that you're dealing with um, two charged objects that are repulsed, and so they're storing some potential energy between them. You would actually, in the case, so this is Newtonian. Newtonian. In the Einsteinian case, i.e. this new theory, you would get some m, I guess we'll call this m prime, just so it's not the same m. You get some m prime, and now m prime would not equal 2m. It would actually be a little bit greater. So m prime would be uh, a little bit little bit greater than 2m, right? Because there's actually mass being stored, and inertia being stored in the energy of the potential energy of the interaction. It's small, right? So in other words, this component, the number that corresponds to this for any typical charges, typical distances, etc., is much, much less than this number over here. And so you don't notice it very much, but it's there. Okay, in fact, we can see these, these things in experiments. 
So that's kind of crazy. So just having energy in a system means that it behaves like it has more mass to it. And that's, that's kind of crazy. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. And so we talked about energy and velocity. We talked about time dilation, length contraction. There's also one last concept, which is interesting. And I'll just kind of say it in words, which is we talked about this notion of proper time. Uh, we talked about the notion of uh, proper length, which actually I didn't. Let me go add that up here. I apologize. What I meant to say earlier was that there's this notion of proper time, remember, which is the time between events in which the events are st in the frame in which they're stationary. And there's also a notion of proper length, which, where did the L go? Here we go. There's a notion of proper length. So this thing, this is called the proper length. I knew I was going to forget something. And that's the uh, length or distance, whatever you want to think of it, length of an object or whatever of an object um, <coughs> in the rest frame rest frame of the object, i.e. so Carlos, remember on the on the cart here, Carlos is standing still on the, on the cart, so he is in the rest frame of the object, so the measure, the length that he measures, uh, capital L, is the proper length. Okay, so I think, I'll, I won't do a review, I think I, we were pretty clear, but I'll just remind you that the two key, the two key things are up here, right? It's the, all laws of physics are identical in all inertial reference frames. We defined what an inertial reference frame is relative to a non-inertial reference frame. And that led us to the fact that any two observers that are in an initial reference frame, whatever, even if they're moving with respect to each other, those observers will calculate exactly the same speed of light because the laws of physics are the same in both of those situations. Then we use that fact, those two facts, to construct this thought experiment of a light clock and figured out, oh, actually time is literally going to pass differently for the two um, observers in their two different frames of reference, which is kind of crazy, but true. It actually happens, and you can go read about time dilation, all the different experiments on Wikipedia or, and elsewhere uh, that have confirmed this. And then sim similarly, length contraction, you can do set up a slightly different experiment, but similar in, in the sense that there's two moving inertial reference frames, or well, moving with respect to each other, and calculate actually a difference in length of objects. And again, not because there's any kind of squishing or force that's causing it to contract, it's because space itself is changing to make sure that the speed of light is constant, right? Okay, and then we talked quickly about, uh, or briefly about Einstein's statement about energy. We learned up there at the top that actually E equals MC squared is really the more boring and special case of a more general idea, which is here. And I said that we didn't quite have the math to, we had to kind of start here, oops. There we go. We had to start here, but we couldn't quite get to the very, very beginning and do it from you know simple geometric arguments. However, there's actually a um, a really nice uh, video series on special relativity that I recommend. It's on YouTube, YouTube, and it's called Minute Minute Physics, and he has uh, a video about the derivation of this that I think is actually quite clear. You know, he uses like cats and spaceships and says, okay, here's what's going on. Let's imagine, yada, yada. So there's a, I'll let you look that up. Just if you go to, if you go to YouTube and just type in minute physics, I believe there's no space between the two words, uh, you will get to their channel. And there's a whole series on special relativity, which is very good. It's a little more mathy than ours. So it's meant for a slightly more advanced level. But if you feel like you really grasped everything that we just talked about, you might be ready to to take his six-part video series. I think six or seven parts, I forget. But anyway, it's very good. Okay, and then we the last thing that we really learned, well, apart from these two examples, which I'll come back to in one moment, was that you could put an arbitrary amount of energy into a massive object, and it will never get above the speed of light. In fact, it really will never reach the speed of light. You have to put an infinite amount of energy just to get V to equal C. And uh, I will point out one other quick thing, which is that the... You can use these techniques that we've talked about here to show that actually any massless particle, i.e. a photon, any massless particle must travel at the speed of light. So it turns out that that's just another fundamental um, law in nature as well. So massless particles in general travel at the speed of light, uh, of which photons are one case. And then we talked about these two examples, and I think the second example is really the one that should cook your noodle a little bit, which is the 
the hell happened here? There we go. Um, which is that by virtue of having potential energy stored in the electric field between the two objects, that increases the perception of mass in the system. And that's kind of crazy. So, Okay, um, I hope you enjoyed that. There, now that you are at the end and you made it through, congratulations. And also, what I'm going to tell you is there's, there's no rock time right here and now. However, I'm going to post another video. I'm going to call it, I forget what lecture this is, but I'm going to call it the next lecture. I think it's 26 or 27. And really, between you and me, it's not going to be a lecture. It's actually just going to be uber rock time. We're going to go over some really cool uh, rocks and actually more than just rocks because I'm at home, so I can show you more than just that. So, uh, you know, your Easter egg for watching to the end of this video is that you get the knowledge that uh, the next video is going to be just for visual and aesthetic pleasure. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, have a lovely weekend. And please don't forget to fill out the um, course survey form. I would appreciate that feedback. Okay, thanks. <laughs>